What's up, my wizards? It's D Breezy from SBMT Jeezy. We like it a magic. And today, there's a bunch of corset spoilers. Like, a, a lot. They dumped, like, 50 spoilers on us since the last time I did a spoiler video yesterday. So, today, we're going to cut the crap and look, look at what slaps. I think that's what the kids are saying nowadays. So, in other words, let's look at the best cards from today. Now, we'll work our way up through what got spoiled last night all the way into what got spoiled just before I came on camera today. First of all, here's Risen Reef. Now, this really gives you an idea of what I think the best cards from today are. Trust me, we're cutting a bunch of, like, bad, really limited playable, and in some, some cases, not limited playable commons and stuff today. But I still want to look at a, a great deal of cards, including this. Risen Reef is three mana, one a green and a blue for a 1-1 one, one elemental. Whenever Risen Reef or another elemental enters the battlefield under your control, look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you may put it onto the battlefield tapped. If you don't put the card onto the battlefield, you put it into your hand. First of all, the art. The art, right? It's cool. Alliterative name. I always like that. <laughs> Aside from that, I like the card itself, too. This is going to ramp you sometimes, and if it doesn't ramp you, it still draws you a card. The body's really small. Kind of not a huge fan of that. And really, just a 3-mana 1-1 that draws you a card is an incredible... Not everyone's packing Sky Scanner into their deck or anything, but this is still a pretty neat little piece that I wonder if it's ever going to actually do anything. Again, highly doubtful. There's probably more desirable three drops in Standard for the whole time this thing's going to be in Standard, but at the same time, it intrigues me of nothing else. Now that we got one of my pet cards for the day out of the way, that's not really that good, but I just wanted to bring it up for a second. It deserves a spotlight. Let me go ahead and nip this in the bud. We got to see the black, red, and blue Ley Lines today. I think the only one we haven't seen is the green one, unless I've completely missed it. <laughs> Just like I said yesterday, we saw the white one. Um, I think the ley lines are playable in standard. The big news here is that this is going to be, uh, these are all going to be probably far more affordable versions <laughs> of the ley lines. These needed another printing. These are playable in most formats that they're available to play in, and now they're available to play in standard, and I think they all have their place. The red one might actually help fight Planeswalker decks, Teferi decks in particular, although they can just return this to your hand with Big Teferi and then counter it or something. <laughs> there, there are definitely ways they can deal with a red ley line, but they're going to have to pay for it, and it's going to cost you nothing, so that's kind of nice. <laughs> the black one is just graveyard hate for all kinds of stuff, namely Dreadhorde decks and Phoenix decks and such. So I think that that's going to be a more than impactful card, to say the least, for a lot of black decks. And the blue one, probably not the best one, but... A free you can cast things with flash is a pretty nice little card to have in standard right now, especially with all the amazing planeswalkers floating around. Now, at the same time that we're getting the ley lines, a slightly less exciting cycle <laughs> is starting to take shape here, but these cards are really interesting. I want to talk about them for a second, like Blight Beetle. This is one in a black for a 1-1 one, one insect with protection from green in standard, and creatures your opponents control can't have plus one, plus one counters put on them, so that is really, really neat. It's got protection from the color that it's best against right now. Cards like Growth Chamber Guardian, and a bunch of other stuff. Explore Creatures, for instance. Wild Growth Walker is another great example. Merfolk Branch Walker, Jade Light Ranger, Pelt Collector even. There are just a ton of creatures. Hydroid Crasis, for instance, which just dies to this. They do still get to draw the cards and gain the life, because that's a cast trigger. But when Crasis comes into play, it's just dead. <laughs> if you have a Blight Beetle out, so that's really neat. And and I haven't even really touched on enough the fact that there's a this has protection from a color, and it's in standard. Um, it wasn't long ago I did one of those like cards I want in this or that set videos, and um, you know it's cards that I've, I've created myself just for funs, just for shiggles, and um, one of them had protection from a color, and like most of the comment section was like, no, you can't do protection in standard, bro. Wizard's never gonna do that again. Well, <laughs> never say never. <laughs> I guess, you know, I don't really mind protection, especially on a 1-1. One, one. And from a color like green that really, I don't know if it doesn't really have that much targeted removal or anything, but this is mostly about the, um, the plus one, plus one counters clause, which is, could even affect the modern format for a variety of reasons. So this little two mana 1-1 one, one is a lot more playable than it looks at first glance. And that's also true of Unchained Berserker, another two mana 1-1 one, one with protection. This one is one and a red for a 1-1 one, one human berserker with pro white, which that definitely deserves discussing. And it gets plus two plus oh as long as it's attacking. So this is basically 
this kind of feels like um, an Adanto Vanguard, kind of, um, especially against, obviously, white deck, against Adanto Vanguards. <laughs> this, this matches them very, very well. But the real news here is that this is an incredible two-drop for red decks, again, against Teferi decks. Well, one of the worst things that can happen if you're playing aggro is to have Teferi, baby Teferi, three fairy dropped on you. Um, on your opponent's turn three, it really halts your progress, gets them a card, it just hurts an awful lot. But this can't be returned by either three fairy or five fairy here of Dominaria. Um, Dominaria. And that's really, really important on an aggressive two-drop creature right now. Plus, for what it's worth, it can't be, you know, Conclave Tribunal, Dixalon's Binding, a bunch of other you know, removal spells, Seal Away, Baffling in, whatever. So, there's just a lot of use on this. It attacks straight through mono white decks in the sort of aggro mirror. Yeah, for, for lack of a better term there. But when Mono Red comes up against Mono White, this is an amazing card to have on your board. So I'm actually really excited for this card, even though it kind of looks unassuming at first. This thing is jam-packed with value in the current standard meta. You know what else it protects against? Pacifism. Because this card is back. And we're not going to talk about too many comments today, but this is definitely one you want to bring up. First of all... Next time they do an, a standard popper event on Arena, remember that Pacifism is playable because it's probably just the de facto best removal in the format. Like, Luminous Bonds was already on the short list of amazing removal in standard popper, and this is just strictly better at Luminous Bonds. You can play both if you wanted to, but for Pacifism, is going to be a feature in pretty much every standard popper white deck, so that's... Keep, keep that in the back of your brain for next time they do that event. But again, just if you want cheap removal, Pacifism is is a legendary card. I mean, not literally. It doesn't say that on the card. But you know what I mean. This card has quite the reputation and for a reason. It's just two mana straight up removal against huge dudes you don't want attacking you. And yeah, it's not great against creatures with activated or triggered abilities or whatever. You know, like on Kefnet or Oketra, probably not your best choice necessarily. <laughs> but at the same time, just against huge things that you don't want to end the game, Pacifism is an amazing two mana removal spell that effectively generates a ton of mana value when you play it. So I wouldn't be surprised to see this card slot into a standard deck here and there. It really is that good. But back on to Uncommons that got spoiled today. We saw Loyal Pegasus, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this other than just to say this is a great include for the Mono White deck, I bet. And sometimes I think they're looking for another good one drop. Not, not to add to the deck, but to take something out and put in. You know, there's definitely ways you could flex this in by taking out perhaps Hunted Witness, although I'm not sure that's the best choice. Some of these mono white decks will play like Snubhorn Sentry, though, and I'm pretty sure that Loyal Pegasus is a better choice than that. You know, this is more or less another copy of Sky Marcher Aspirant that gets flying way faster. So I love Loyal Pegasus, and I think that it's a great card for these mono white decks. I don't see a world where they don't try to play it. Good time to reprint this, is all I'm saying, but I'm going to move on to Overgrowth Elemental, 3 mana. Two and a green for a 3-2 elemental. When it enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on another target elemental you control. And whenever another creature you control dies, you gain a life. If that creature was an elemental, put a plus one, plus one counter on overgrowth elementals. I think this is worth talking about for just a second because of a few interactions it might have in the coming standard. Especially post-rotation in the fall. Because there, it looks like a much better 3-drop because we've got better options right now, like Jade Light Ranger, for instance, and a couple of other cards. But I think this is a 3-drop we might want to look into post-rotation. But until rotation, this works pretty good with, say, Wild Growth Walker, for instance, too. So there's some tasty stuff in the mono green pile, but at the same time, this could work pretty well with 3-mana Chandra at some point in its standard life cycle because the 3-mana Chandra will make 2 elemental tokens almost every turn. Um, and those sack at end of turn, so that's an extra two life you're gaining every turn, an extra two power that this grows every turn, so you're keeping the power from the elementals on the battlefield after you sack them, and I think that's actually really neat and could lead to some cool interactions, but all in all, I'm not sure the card is entirely there. But another green uncommon that I think could be there is Barkhide Troll. This is two mana for a 2-2 two -two troll, and it enters the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it, so it's effectively a two mana 3-3. Three, three. Uh, good stats. And you can pay one and remove a plus one, plus one counter from Barkhide Troll and have it gain Hexproof until end of turn, which is awesome. That's really, really cool, especially if you can put multiple plus one, plus one counters on it in some way or another. Proliferate comes to mind. So this could have Hexproof multiple times in a game, which is really sweet. And although this looks like a two drop, and you can play it that way, a two mana three, three is fine, but sometimes you'll want this to be a three drop because you want to have the mana up 
to uh, protect it the turn that it comes out. And even if that means, you know, just turning it into an undying creature, basically, you know, or I guess a, a creature with persist in that case, um, then that's still good on a two drop. A two drop that survives uh, most removal, it doesn't survive sweepers for the most part, and that kind of sucks, but it's still going to survive all manner of removal and combat interactions for that matter um, in the early game. And I think that that looks really good. I don't think it makes mono green a deck tomorrow because there's a really heavy commitment to green in this card, but it is definitely the kind of three drop you want to be looking at, or the kind of two drop you want to be looking at even, um, in a mono green deck if you're looking to make that deck. So far we've got like Thorn Lieutenant, Growth Chamber Guardian, and those are great two drops for a Stompy deck, but not quite at the level it need to be in the power department, whereas this is. It kind of reminds me of a Strangle Root Geist, and that's a really, really playable card, so I could see this going places. Now in a moment, I'm going to start talking to you face to face, but there's just a couple of other uncommons I want to clean up on here, like Rule of Law. Sweet reprint here, not sure this actually sees any standard play, but obviously it could, and there could be some sort of lock um, coming up in standard that you can use with rule of law because that's usually how you want to use rule of law is somehow lock your opponent out of playing spells either by getting a counter spell back to your hand every turn somehow there are definitely ways of doing this or just making it to where your opponent can only play the one spell a turn through rule of law but their first spell gets countered by a different effect there's definitely ways you can pull this off the first common that I, I really want to talk just mano a mano to you about and that's goblin ring leader this is probably the card that people are like most hype about from the last 24 hours four mana three and a red for a goblin it's a 2-2 with haste and when it enters the battlefield you reveal the top four cards of your library put all goblin cards revealed this way into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order well after a very very long hiatus uh extended goblins <laughs> It's finally back. You can play it in modern now. Uh, and in case you don't, you haven't ever heard that phrase in your magic life, extended is kind of what modern was before modern existed. So that is that is sort of the most uh, succinct way of putting it. Uh, old timers will occasionally whisper about the extended format. It's something we had a very long time ago. And it kind of dates you if you even know about it. But this sort of also got... Um, sort of shifted to Legacy Goblin. Sometimes people refer to this same deck um, in that manner. And basically, all it is is Ether Vial, Goblin Matron, and a bunch of other goblins. Just a bunch of other goblins. <laughs> it's just an insane deck. They get so much card advantage, plays super wide, and just wins. It's a ridiculous deck, and most people haven't played it in 15 years? It might, something like that. Uh, it's been a long time, but I guess the question is, like, has the power level gotten so high that now this deck is bad? I don't know. Well, I guess we'll see. Not really my call to make, but people are definitely going to try to make it work. Just a huge card advantage swing that you don't even have to wait to attack with if you don't want to. And if it does die, who cares? You got the value. You got two or three cards off of it. Card is just like historically insane, and I expect that it's still going to be pretty insane. Last uncommon I think that I want to cover today is Veil of Summer. This is just one green mana for an instant. Check this out, everybody. Draw a card if an opponent has cast a blue or black spell this turn. Spells you control can't be countered this turn. You and permanent you control gain hexproof from blue and black until end of turn. This is crazy. Like, I'm not sure if I would have wanted this or Blossoming Defense more in standard because Blossoming Defense will help you win combat situations and stuff like that. It was a really important card when it was in standard, but this draws you a card. So even though you don't go up on power at all, you still you get a card. <laughs> it's insane. It's a counter against counter spells um, in every way that you'd want it to be. It's also a counter against like black base removal and stuff like that. It even counters thought erasures, which is really sweet. Draw your card too. This card just does a lot right now. And a lot of people's take is that this is a sideboard card, but I think certain decks could probably fit that sneaky, that sneaky boy one of in there, even though this is mostly just a color hosing card. Not necessarily in the current standard meta, because most decks are going to include these exact colors. So I think you might could sneak on one up in the main deck with very little opportunity cost in, you know, from diamond and on up in arena, and definitely in really competitive paper play, because most people are going to be on 
Esper. And <laughs> sometimes Grixis, but you're going to get Thought Erasure. You're going to have a spell or two countered in a given game. You're going to have a creature removed in a game. And this is great against all of them. And it's definitely going to be an at least three of, if not four of, sideboard option for every deck that has green mana and also plays creatures. <laughs> it's just, and might, maybe even decks that don't play creatures. <laughs> It's just the blowout that is available with this card in your hand against certain decks is just almost unstatable. <laughs> Seriously, for just one green mana, this card is unbelievable. But let's get to these rares finally. Here's Ravenous Hydra. We'll start off with this. It's X and 2 green for a Hydra with Trample. It starts as a 0-1, but it enters the battlefield with X plus 1 plus 1 counters. And when it enters the battlefield, you choose one of these two options. You either double the number of plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, or the Hydra may fight a creature you don't control. I think there are probably going to be just straight up better options at the Hydra slot <laughs> the whole time this is in standard. Like, I imagine that Hydra Crisis is just better. You just play Hydra Crisis. But, but, at the same time, doubling the number of counters that go on it is actually really good, because the traditional issue with Hydras is that, like, they're never going to be on curve, ever. But this, this solves that problem pretty cleanly, and I like that. You know, pump four mana into it, get a 4-4. Four, four. That's cool. <laughs> That's very cool. So, I like, I like that, but I also like the fight a thing. Especially if you have access to a bunch of mana. Like, if you're playing a Nissa deck, I could see maybe testing out. Maybe not ultimately running. It would really depend. But that's why you test a copy, at least, of this. Because sometimes in the mid to late game, just any time after you get your Nissa down, this is going to come down, be a huge thing, and kill something on the other side of the table. And that's really good. It's like a much better Ravenous Chupacabra or something. A Necrotal type effect. Where you just end up with like a 6-6 six, six or bigger. And... Also, you kill their best creature. So that, almost good enough to, to at least to, to play, but at least good enough to try. I want to give it a shot. We also got to see Planar Cleansing reprinted today. It's six mana, three and three white for sorcery. Just destroy all non-land permanents. All of them. R.I.P. Planeswalkers, right? <laughs> hopefully, I mean, I don't know. Do I mean hopefully? Because, like, the decks that want, that would play this are probably the decks that play all the Planeswalkers, right? Like, Esper might want a sweeper like this, um, but they, they also don't want to just wipe all their Teferis and stuff. So, it's sort of hard to see a deck where this sees all the play, unless it's just a straight-up, dedicated Drago sort of control deck. And even that kind of deck has to dedicate six mana and tapping out to a card like this. I want the card to do stuff, but it is notoriously expensive and didn't do a whole heck of a lot last time it was in Standard, other than be like a one or two of in the Sphinx's Revelations decks. And this isn't the card that was making those decks good. So I'm just not entirely sold, even though we are in a world full of Planeswalkers. And if the card sees any play, it's going to be because of that. Here's a personal favorite from the day. Even though I've taken like six takes at this, because for some reason I've forgotten how to read in the last 30 seconds. This is Starfield Mystic. Two mana, one and a white for a 2-2 human cleric. Enchantment spells you cast cost one less to cast. And whenever an enchantment you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Starfield Mystic. Nailed it that time. Garfield Mystic. Richard Garfield Mystic uh, is actually awesome. I really like Enchantress decks in Commander. Like, kind of... A lot because I've liked Enchantress decks since like 1995, like the year I started playing Magic. Um, one of the first decks I ever put together was like Venduran Enchantress. So I just got a, got a soft spot in my heart for stuff like this. So I'm just glad the card exists and it's another really important card for Enchantress decks. And yeah, there's some stuff you can do in standard with it. I guess, you know, play Wilderness Reclamation on turn three, something, I don't know, do things. But for the most part, you're probably going to see this on the EDH table. There's nothing wrong with that. The card is sweet. But let's check out Bishop of the Exalted, everybody. We wanted an Angel 2 drop. We didn't think it was going to take this form, but here we go. Two white mana for a 1-4 human cleric. Whenever an angel enters the battlefield under your control, gain four life. Whenever an angel you control dies, create a 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying. That's it. That's it. Two drop angel right there. I mean, it's not an actual angel itself, but it's still <laughs> something that really benefits you playing angels. And if nothing else, this is going to be fun for the angel commander players too. But in standard right now, 
We have Mardu Angels, although I don't think you want to play three colors if you're trying to hit a two white one drop on turn two. But I mean, you could still play Boros if you wanted to with Feather and Aurelia. That seems like a good list. You could play Black White with like Seraph of the Scales as your four drop. Either way, you get Resplendent Angel in the three drop slot, plus the new angel we just saw the other day, the uncommon one if you want it, which you probably do in that particular deck, plus obviously Lyra Dawnbringer at the five, so this deck is actually really coming together now. <laughs> it's going to be fun to play, if nothing else. Like, all these cards are powerful on their own, but this just gives you a synergistic piece that, you know, again, adds to the synergy in that deck because there really wasn't much outside of Lyra, right? So <laughs> this is just another synergy piece, and the deck really needed that if it's going to be a deck at all. But up next is Golos. Tireless Pilgrim. I really like the cut of this guy's jib. He looks super sweet, but he's a 5-mana 3-5 legendary artifact creature who's also a scout. And when he enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a land card, put it onto the battlefield tap, shuffle your library. And, and, you can pay two, a white, a blue, a black, a red, and a green, just all the colors, plus two generic, to exile the top three cards of your library and play them this turn without paying their mana costs. Okay, so just obligatory, this is a good commander, probably, you know, go get any land, not a basic, any land, that opens up a huge amount of possibilities in a format, like commander, so I shouldn't even have to point that out, and it's got all of the colors as a color identity, dope, this is a ridiculous commander, and if you can actually activate the ability, it's very good. <laughs> It's a very, very good ability. So I really like this as far as a, a sweet EDH commander, but I want to talk about standard for a second. And yeah, I'm totally serious because I really like this in any chromatic deck. You know, my instant uh, thing that I want to say is uh, chromatic black. And I really like it in chromatic black because you can go get Cabal Stronghold with it. The, the turn it comes out, it's not lightning strikeable, it's not lava coilable, that's really sweet, it's not cast downable either, so I, there's a lot of cool stuff, it dodges some important removal in the format right now, love that about it, so it's likely to stay out, goes and get your Cabal Stronghold and chromatic, black, and chromatic Black, and if you have your Chromatic Lantern out, it is super easy to, you know, resolve this ability to activate this ability. Sometimes multiple times in a turn if it's the relative late game. It's just an insane mana sink that allows you to play spells for free. And that could actually see play in Chromatic Black and Standard, but it could also see play in Chromatic Green. Chromatic Green is in fact a deck because Nyssa is a card, you know? And this card also looks very good and very easy to get the triggers on, um, the activated ability on, excuse me, in a deck like that. So. I'm not counting this out of seeing standard play. It just dodges so much important removal in the format. Goes and gets any, any land at all, which is just really good for a variety of decks. I see a lot of playability on this five drop. Let's calm down just a little bit and look at Field of the Dead, which I, I still think is a good card. This is just a, a land. You can go get it with your Golos. But anyway, it enters the battlefield tapped, and you can tap it for just a colorless mana. But here's the fun part. Whenever Field of the Dead or another land enters the battlefield under your control, landfall, if you control seven or more lands with different names, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. Really good in Commander, where you're probably playing a bunch of lands with different names anyway. That seems good. And you just get a 2-2 every time you land, fall, or when this comes into play. So that's sweet as well. So just keep that in mind. This can trigger its own ability. Sweet. But very often, if you're in a Commander deck that gets to play multiple lands in a turn, this is just going to be a ridiculous card that fills your board really fast. So keep that in mind. It's probably worth a one of in, in, in Commander decks that want this kind of ability. But this is another card we could at least momentarily discuss for standard. I think that the condition is going to be really difficult to hit. But while we have cards like Wayward Swordtooth in standard, it becomes a little bit easier. And for a long time, we'll have our Boreal Grazer, Gross Spiral. So you can hit your land drops really, really fast. And um, play a bunch of different lands too, you know? Like this could actually be a card that has tension in like a four-color deck, but is still somewhat playable if you somehow have the slot for a colorless land in your four-color deck. Because it goes without saying, you'll have to play a bunch of different duels in there. And in the late game, this just becomes a way to generate value every turn, even if you draw dead. And there's a lot to be said for a control deck or a mid-range deck that can do that. So I'm not counting this card out of playability just yet. 
Well, let's take a look at Legion's End here, and we're almost at the end of the video, but there's a couple of really hyped cards I want to get to before we close things out. But Legion's End is two mana, one and a black for a sorcery. Exile target, creature and opponent controls with converted mana cost two or less, and all the other creatures that player controls with the same name as that creature. Then that player reveals their hand and exiles all cards with that name from their hand and their graveyard, but not their library. A lot of people are misreading this card. Let me throw that out there. Hand and graveyard, not library. And even though it doesn't say rob their library of all those creatures, I still think it's a pretty fine card. In a format like Modern, where a card like this probably gets the most discussion, I'm not sure it's worth it over just better options. One mana <laughs> removal options. And, um, uh, you know, Dismember, Fatal Push. And then how much room do you have for this? I'm just not sure. But this can take out Death Shadow and knock out all the other Death Shadows from their hand in their graveyard. And take out a bunch of other small creatures that people are messing around with. You know, Snapcaster Mage comes to mind. Even things like Tarmogoyf. You know, there, there are things. There are things. Um, and I guess Tarmogoyf in the, in the early game specifically. Well, no, anytime. It's converted mana cost. So... The, again, in a format that revolves around mostly creatures with a smaller converted mana cost, I think this is actually a pretty decent card. It just becomes a question of opportunity cost and whether it's worth using these slots when you could play something that gets you a little bit more mana value and is a little bit more consistent, all things considered. That said, the moment you do two or, God forbid, three for one, your opponent on this, it has definitely pulled its weight. And yeah, you gotta pull, you gotta point this out. It takes out like entire boards full of tokens, which is gonna matter some of the time, both in modern and standard too. So there are things to like about the card. I'm just not sure it's all the way there. But once things like say cast down, rotate out, then maybe this card can see some play. But let's move on to Hanged Executioner here as we round the corner on the day. Three mana, two and a white for a 1-1 one, one spirit with flying. Another flying spirit for standard. When Hanged Executioner enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying. And you can pay three and a white and exile Hanged Executioner to exile target creature. That's good. That's a good... Uh, and I love the, ir the ironic flavor on this. I think it's really cute. Um, Hanged Executioner, blah, blah, blah. But also, the fact that, yeah, it costs seven mana all totaled up, but the fact that you can sacrifice this on a subsequent turn, or maybe in response to it getting removed, or getting blocked, or blocking in combat, and just exile anything, that's, that's very, very good. That's a fantastic ability to have on a body, and you get more value than that. Like, even if you play this on turn three, and then sack it immediately when you play your fourth land on turn four, and kill something... You still get value, like you still get a body on the battlefield and take their best creature off their side of the table. In the meantime, though, before you do that, you get two flying bodies, which is better than nothing. <laughs> you can attack some of the time and keep your opponent off of playing like huge stuff, like your opponent has to play around this. If you have it out and they don't have like a big creature or something, you know? Like, let's say your opponent has a board with like two guys on it, but they also have like a four casting cost creature or five casting cost creature in their hand, and you have this on the table. Well, they're probably not going to want to cast their 5-drop. <laughs> it's just going to get removed. What's the use, right? But if they don't cast their 5-drop and get it exiled, they're just going to keep getting attacked into for flying damage. So, like, this is actually, I think, in practice, a better card than it looks upon first inspection. I can't wait to mess around with it because, again, 7 mana is a lot, but split into 2 turns, it's really not that much. And if you top deck this in the late game and you have to pay 7 mana to exile that thing that's about to kill you, I'm pretty sure you don't care that you have to do that either. You're fine with that, so... I like a lot about this card. But here's my favorite card of the day, I think. It's the one I'm most hyped about, and that's Kalia, Zenith Seeker. Kalia's back. This is three mana Mardu colors, red, a white, and a black, for a 3-3 legendary human cleric with flying and vigilance. And when Zenith Seeker enters the battlefield, look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal an angel card, a demon card, and or a dragon card from among them and put them into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So in case you lost count there, this three-drop flying vigilance creature that's at least on or above rate, especially in standard, can draw you up to three cards. <laughs> that's freaking nuts. Card is absolutely insane. It's going to be a great commander, if nothing else. I keep saying that about cards today, but again, a really fun commander to be messing around with, but I'm down to try and play this in standard. Like, even if you only draw one card off of it, it's very, very good. It's very good. I wish that it were an angel itself. That'd be sweet. Just play it in Mardu Angels, right? 
Um, you don't really care about demons or dragons at that point, but there are definitely playable demons, dragons, and angels in all three of these colors in standard right now, and Mardu Midrange is already threatening to sort of be a deck. It's got the pieces, it just has to come together, and a card advantage piece on turn three like this is insane. If, like, it has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with because it's a above rate, in standard at least. Three drop. Flying Vigilance 3-3 three, three for three mana is very good. And that's going to kill you if you don't lightning strike it or something. You have to deal with this. And you can't cast down it. You can't Moment of Craving or shock it. Like This dodges some really heavily played removal in standard. And even if you do, you know, like, oh my goodness. <laughs> now that I think about it, even if they do have like bounce removal like Blink of an Eye or something for it, you're just going to get this again so that kind of removal doesn't work. It just effectively dodges a lot of cool removal right now that's fairly heavily played. So keep that in mind too. And even if they do somehow manage to deal with it and not take too much damage to it before they do so, you still at least got a card off of it. Six cards is a huge dig. So if you're dedicated to playing angels or dedicated to playing dragons or something, then yeah, you at least got a card, if not two, off of this. And it's just impossible to deal with. It's like a hydroid crisis. <laughs> That's, you, know, you can compare this to hydroid crisis in a way. Or like another interesting comparison is like Niv-Mizzet Reborn. But this is far easier to cast than Niv-Mizzet and gets you at least some value at a lower cost than a hydroid crisis ever will. So, like, the rate on this is crazy, and it might not see standard play on day one, but at some point in its standard life cycle, someone's going to figure out how to break it, and it's a race. I want to do this. Mardu Midrange might be one of the first decks that I build in Corset Standard, just because this card exists. I don't know if I'm too excited, but a three mana, three, three, flying vigilance, draw a card, or three, is just, mm, that's a card I want to play with. I don't know about you. That's, I do. Whew. Sorry, I got to get worked up here, get the vapors. <laughs> I'm telling you, if, I haven't seen the take that Cali is bad, but if you're making the take that Cali is bad, I think you're wrong. Um, let me just make that clear in case I didn't. But I think that that is it for the day. I'm done getting worked up for no reason um, about cardboard. <laughs> you can tell at least I'm passionate, damn it. <laughs> anyway, I think that's it for now. Just let me know how you felt about all these. It's your turn. You go. Untap your lands. Draw and, and go and let me know down there how you felt about all this mess today and if i cut out any cards you're excited about seeing like let me know that too that's important maybe i'll include them in tomorrow's video so i read your comments sound off let me know how you felt and like the video if you enjoyed it subscribe if you haven't done it yet what are you doing subscribe you want spoilers you're entertained are you not entertained subscribe <laughs> hit the bell for notifications join the patreon if you really want to help your dude out there's a lot of cool stuff that you get for joining the patreon do it check out the link in the description and also you can tell until I'm trying to finish this one up. Go over to TCG Player, link in the description to pre-order not only a lot of these singles that we've seen so far, if you want specific singles for decks, but also just like sealed product, booster boxes. Pre-order all that M20 mess. First link in the description. And I catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.